Art Speaks Lecture, a series of nine lectures that is sponsored by the Terra Foundation on American Art, as well as the University of Chicago's Graham School for Continuing Liberal and Professional Studies. I am Fred Beitler, the Associate Dean uh, for Liberal Arts at the Graham School, uh, and I wanted, I'm proud to introduce, um, excuse me, I'm proud to introduce Lynn ba Bassa, yes, who is a public artist. Uh, and I want to give a few, little bit of background on her because she's changing her talk tonight. It was originally, why is this here? Uh, and now it's confessions of a public artist, but it's still on public art. Uh, one of the things that's exciting to be in this room, uh, this room is the dining hall of the Hull House complex. And if you go back 100 years ago, it would have been turned about 90 degrees and moved underneath the walkway there, so right connected with the Hull House uh, uh, building. And in fact, at the time of uh, Jane Addams, this was a 13 building complex that took up about a half of a city block, uh, which is a fascinating place to be here. It's one of the centers, in many ways, of public art at Chicago. Uh, now, the Terra Foundation is sponsoring this year a whole series of over 30 exhibitions on art design Chicago. Uh, and the University of Chicago's Graham School is partnering with them to have a series of lectures that will connect some of the exhibits. And so this evening, Lynn Bassett is going to be uh, speaking on Confessions of a Public Artist. Uh, and to give you a little bit of background on her, she is a painter, sculptor, public artist, and author living in Chicago. Uh, she received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Studio Art and Art History from Indiana University. She received a Master's of Public Administration in Public Art, which I thought was an interesting public policy degree to connect with this. And then most recently, in 2016, she received a Master's of Fine Art in Studio from the Art Institute, uh, the School of the Art Institute here. Uh, she is uh, the uh, solo exhibitor at over 14 exhibits. Uh, and to give you a sense of how her public art career has been, she has received over 32 public art commissions. She's also the author, well, she has a series of awards, and I wanted to ask her, maybe afterwards, but she actually received an award from the International Parking Institute, yes. uh, which I want, do you, does that come with like free parking for life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish. You wish, okay. <laughs> well, she's also the author of The Artist's Guide to Public Art, How to Find and Win Commissions. And as the recipient of 32 commissions, I think you know how to do that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a lecture, a slide lecture for about 45 minutes or so, and then open it up to Q&A. All right? So with that, welcome Lynn Boss. Thank you, Hi. Thank you all for coming. I know what it takes to get out after work or after you've even been home. And, uh, I have, yes, it's true, I've won uh, over 32 commissions, but I've applied for about 400. <laughs> so that's a, let that be an inspiration to you. And I wanted to thank uh, Nikki Yagoda. She's the one who initially invited me for the Terra Foundation and uh, the Graham School to come and speak. And it, it's very special to be at Jane Addams Hall House. Uh, as, and thank you for them for hosting this. Um, and I've attended several other art and design talks uh, as part of their Art Speaks series, and I found them to be very scholarly. I am not scholarly, so this will not be that. Um, I was going to try to be scholarly, but I um, realized, and it was really making me anxious, and so I was kind of examining why that was making me anxious, and it's because I am an artist and I experience the world through my work and through myself, so I don't experience it as a, at a remove. And I experience the world by moving through it. So I decided to talk about public art from my uh, own point of view, from the trenches of a 40-year career as an administrator, educator, artist, curator. And I think I was pretty cranky when I changed the, the name to that. <laughs> so I've, I have good days and bad days where I just get really frustrated with the system the way it, it currently is. Yet at the same time, it's the hand that feeds me. So I have to tread lightly while I'm eating from the hand that feeds me. I don't know. That's an interesting. Um, I'm, I just, this is new material for me that I've written. I mean, I have it, I've lived it and I have it all in my head and everything. But 
Um, I'm going to have to read part of it because I don't, I don't have it. Uh, I'm not all slick with this yet. And I, one, my first confession is I'm actually more interested in what you all have to say than what I have to say because I know what I'm going to say. So afterwards, I'm going to, I want to have a discussion, not just a Q&A, because as you'll see from my talk, what I'm, what I'm really interested in doing is inspiring other artists to do what they can from where they are, as many of the artists I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, read a little bit, and then sometimes I might go off on a tangent. Um, so public art has morphed into something called uh, creative placemaking. It's kind of a hybrid of urban planning, economic development, and socially engaged practice. So this idea of uh, sculpture in a plaza is, may have been where it started out, but it's really become something quite different these days. And Chicago is uh, a nexus for this way of thinking and approaching public art. Now, creative placemaking has gotten a, uh, it's kind of public art with benefits, but it's gotten a bad rap because it's become associated with being a tool for developers to displace longtime residents. It's called art washing. It's still mostly economic. Um, it's, you know, about tourism dollars, increasing the tax base, stimulating development. As a public artist, that's a lot of what we're, why we're asked to come in and do a public art commission. Millennium Park is the shining example and has influenced thinking all over the country on what art on a plaza can accomplish. And it's set a new standard for public art tourism, public artist spectacle and public artist tourism. And I'm going to read from my, the second edition of my book, which hasn't been published yet. Uh, a two, a, a 20, a, this is like, I'm reading, I'm just reading statistics now, this is, so it's the latest. So a, a, 2005 economic impact study confidently predicted that the yearly variation, or the yearly visitation will be in excess of three million at Millennium Park. They were way off. In 2016, Millennium Park had 12.9 million visitors, and that was only in the last six months of the year. In 2005, they predicted that total visitor spending would get up to 2.6 billion annually by 2015. Instead, in 2014, the annual estimated gross sales from visitor spending attributable to Millennium Park was 1.2 trillion. <laughs> I know. Um, it has spurred equally prediction-busting growth in new development of residences, hotels, and adaptive reuse of office buildings. Rents have increased 22% since the park opened, and it boasts occupancy rates 95% higher than the rest of the city in that surrounding area. So the economics of public art is one way to measure the effectiveness of public art. And it's most often used because it's the most quantifiable. But another way that Millennium Park works, in my mind, extremely successfully, is that it's a melting pot of humanity. It creates opportunities for social interaction. And therein lies the creative placemaking aspect of that. Now, you didn't think you'd get away with not hearing about some of my work. So this is a piece I just finished it, uh, on Milwaukee Avenue at Wicker Park, um, in Wicker Park on Milwaukee and Wood. And it, there used to be a, a planter there, and they wanted a sculpture. But what I did was I opened this up, and I, I made it up to be an ode to the worker cottage, the disappearing worker cottage in Wicker Park. And there's quite a bit of um, history there. The cobblestones underneath are from Milwaukee Avenue. The limestone is, and the carving on the limestone benches is the same as what you find in the lintels. But more importantly, it got into the work, immigrant working class history that Milwaukee Avenue has always represented. And the, the worker cottages were the first affordable uh, standardized homes that were built for um, workers. Before that, this was after the Chicago fire, of course, there was a huge boom in these. And before that, people were building their own houses or living in tenements. And they used to have the children all living in one, one bedroom, like sleeping in a dog pile, and you know, there are chickens in the front yard. And, um, but this made them kind of respectable. Respectable. This had a parlor. The children had separate bedrooms. They ha had a front yard um, you know, with a fence around it. So um, it was 
architecture is, I don't want to say architecture is destiny, but it sounded good. But I don't really believe that. But architecture really, really makes a difference. In, in the working class in um, Chicago. I could go on and on talking about Milwaukee Avenue and how it uh, rivaled the loop with the number of shops that there were. It was mostly uh, Polish and Eastern, Eastern European people at that time around the turn of the century. I found an article from 1902 that even talked about how um, the price of apartments was really going up there. And there was another article that was talking about there are five hat shops in a row you know, on Milwaukee Avenue. So, but that's, um, that's an, I, that's a, I like to think in my own modest way that this is the Millennium Park of uh, Wicker Park. It's a neighborhood-sized Millennium Park, just because of the way it creates gathering spaces. So um, there's a, another really important thing that happened. I don't know how many of you know about Culture in Action that was curated by Mary Jane Jacob in 1993. There is a quieter, more grassroots form of creative placemaking led by artists who are working with and within communities for transformative change at the social infrastructure level. And in 1993, Mary Jane Jacob curated Culture in Action for Sculpture Chicago. Instead of focusing on sculpture in a plaza, Jacob based the premise of the exhibit on what if the public were brought into the process of not only being able to work with artists in their own communities, but to be part of deciding what form that work should take. So they asked the question, who is the audience for public art and how can the public art and how can public art represent the public when there are so many publics? So there were 10 artists and artist collectives who work with communities of people um, with HIV, kids and gangs, union workers in a candy bar factory who designed their own candy bar. And I had the privilege of seeing it in 1993 as part of a convening where we rode around on school buses and met for presentations in high school classrooms and south side cafes. It transformed a lot of people, how a lot of people thought about the potential of artists to contribute to civic life with their work rather than as outside commentators. And it certainly made an impression on me. It started to plant the seeds of discontent with me and about, about how much artists are asked to do public art commissions that are about a place, its history, its aspirations, its cultures, instead of actually doing anything for that place. I, I was showing this, this is a, a, um, a project that was part of Culture in Action by Inigo Manialo Ovale about the street level youth media. He gave uh, kids in the neighborhood video cameras. Some of the people were in gangs. I talked to a bunch of them when we, because they joined us for lunch. And um, it was so, it, it, to this day, it's become uh, street level uh, media. Youth media has grown out of it, and that's an organization that still exists today. So I wanted to talk about corner, about this is my project, this is my building in Avondale, and my studio is in the storefront. And I just wanted to talk briefly about the corner project because I, I, I want to launch a thousand corners among everybody I talk to uh, so that they feel like they can do this too. So I began corner in 2014 when I went back to SAIC for my MFA and I based it on John Dewey's artist experience, someone else who has a strong connection to Chicago. He founded so social so school sociology or? It? Laboratory school. Laboratory school, yeah, thank you. Laboratory school of Chicago. And then it's nice to just be able to turn and ask. <laughs> And he ate in this room. No, John Dewey ate. Oh my gosh, that's great. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that. There's just so, there's just so many rich interweavings and connections that are uh, going on. But it, with when you get into the social side of public art, and it's particularly in Chicago, I think Chicago is a very special place that way because if it's. Uh, being such a pioneer in social justice movements and workers' rights. Uh, so, okay, back on track. So I, I taught, I, I went back to get my MFA from SAIC, which I highly recommend, because I realized when I was teaching there that I was, had not gotten the kind of education that my students were getting. And I felt that uh, by having a corner storefront comes great responsibility to contribute to the vitality of our main street. 
and I wanted to be a good neighbor. I thought that if I created a program by artists whose work was intended to engage people and was relevant to daily life, that it would reach into an audience that doesn't usually show up. I, with the help of Grace Needleman and Janelle Davis, who acted as gallery directors while I was in school, we prevented, presented 24 installations and performances in two and a half years. I wanted to talk about this a little bit though. This is the, you can't see in the picture very well though, but this whole window is lined with sausages. And um, that's, I thought that if I created a space that was designed to entice people from the neighborhood to come in, that they would come, that I would build it and they would come. And so this is looking out from corner and the main street has changed actually not at all since that time. And so we had events, lots and lots of events. Cabin in the Snow, we had performing arts events. And uh, Edra Soto did an installation in the windows as well as this really wonderful, I don't know what it was, where she played records from the 80s that she had collected as a child and then made dishes that her, her favorite dishes that her mother used to make for her for her birthday. Susan Kruger Barber, I'm tired of looking, I'm, I was looking out the windows all the time at people not stopping for people in the crosswalk. It doesn't even matter. It's like, it just made me so angry. So I uh, asked Susan Kruger Barber to do a residency for a month. She's an artist from Utah on a uh, tactical urbanism intervention in that crosswalk. <laughs> and she has this persona called Art Girl. Um, and so she's been doing quite a bit of work with different types of projects, <laughs> trying to get cars to slow down. But one of the great things that came out of this project is we found out about Vision Zero. We found out that CDOT was planning to do a whole new uh, re redo of a complete streets redo of Milwaukee Avenue from Belmont to Logan Boulevard. And we went to meetings and we got to know um, the commissioner. In fact, through this, I was able to like run up to the commissioner of uh, CDOT at the farmer's market on Sunday and just bust her chops about some things that we're trying to do. This is a um, wonderful project. Kimmy, Kimmy Noonan, who is a photographer who lives in the neighborhood, she turned the whole front of corner into a living space. And so people lived in full view for two days and they invited different people for dinner and then they gave tours of the neighborhood of their of their neighborhood and it was it was such a hit so many people came in but then what happened was the art community showed up but the neighbors from this majority Hispanic community did not and so I ended up doing my thesis on the barriers to entry that we in the art establish establishment set up to those who aren't part of the system and there are quite a few when you really hunker down and do the research and I realized it's not that the public isn't curious or they're apathetic, or they're ignorant, or too busy to go look at art, it's that what I was doing wasn't relevant to them. So I decided to strip away every pre preconception I had about what art was supposed to be. And instead, I asked myself what I could do with who I am, with what I have, where I am. I literally looked outside the windows of corner and saw, as if for the first time, the 100-year-old working class Main Street on Milwaukee Avenue in Avondale that calls itself the neighborhood that built Chicago. Instead of a bunch of old buildings that happen to be next to each other, I saw generations of immigrant mom and pop shopkeepers. Then and now, I saw struggling store owners who didn't know each other. I saw a plague of vacant storefronts, not because nobody wants them, but because of the property owners speculating that someone is going to come along and offer them double the market rate because we're the next hot neighborhood. I learned that this is called high rent blight and that it's plaguing neighborhood main streets all over the country. Oh, I'm, real, I'm already off sync. These are, these are a couple of my heroes. And I just want to say, um, so I got introduced to Saul Alinsky by Ben Fink, who's a community organizer who's working with Apple Shop in, Ken in Kentucky right now. And what would Jane say, uh, of course, is about Jane Adams. And it was written by Janice Metzger, a woman who helped, who was my mentor in, in doing community organizing, because this is basically what the, the Corner Project is now. And Jen had a long struggle with cancer, and she barely finished this book before she died. And one of the last things she did 
was she gave a reading and a presentation right here from this spot. So I'm, it's really significant to me that I'm standing here today remembering her. And it's a great book, too. It's like, what if Jane Addams and all these strong women were, invo were involved in the smoke field rooms, in the planning of, instead of the Burnham plan, um, what, what plan would they have come up with? Because women were so closely involved with um, you know, child welfare and, and workers' rights and, and, and getting people out of the tenements and stuff like that. So, and so she has, it's extremely well researched and she has a lot of, uh, but then she kind of makes up dialogue of these people like Lucy Parker and people like that talking to each other, what we have said. Oh, this is just a, 33% a of our storefronts on the three block area of the corner project are vacant. And this is um, actually three times the rate of the average of the rest of Chicago. Here are a few of the, the uh, showstoppers. This one is owned by a large um, real estate investment company in the suburbs. This one is asking double for what it's worth. I could just go on and on with this. This guy doesn't return the calls of people who want to buy it. They're finally cutting, dunking that down. I mean, it's just like row after row of vacant storefront. And it's, it's something that I'm uh, working quite a bit on by organizing the community about that. So, so basically, the Corner Project is about paying attention to, the, to those things. Now I'm going to talk about other artists, all based in Chicago, who are working to benefit their communities. This is the most public form of public art, in my opinion. And a lot of these artists have initiated, in fact, all of these have initiated these projects without any outside support. They just started with, with what they had and where they were. And this is something anybody can do at any age. And if I feel like, I just want to inspire people to start thinking, you know, like I did about, start, s stop taking what resources that I had for granted. And I'm talking resources just like, Oh, I, um, that's a long story. I'll get back. Like, just you know, resources that you have. Like, artists have a certain amount of agency. Artists have a certain amount of access. We have we have social capital. You know, we might not have financial capital. We have social capital that can allow us to run up to the the um, commissioner of CDOT and just and just start talking to her. You know, and um, so to start thinking of all these assets you have that you might not normally recognize. And I also wanted to thank all the artists here for allowing me to uh, use images from their website and to mention their projects in here. So Barbara Kennan, uh, she started the Creative Resource Exchange, Re Creative Chicago Reuse Exchange, and she was, is an artist who for a long time worked for DCASE, where among other things she founded the Chicago Artist Resource, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. In fact, I was her second, in, I was her first employee uh, when I first moved to Chicago. And my job was to go around and get to know about all the, all the arts organizations and tell them about this new thing called the Chicago Arts Artist Resource. And um, a couple of years ago after she left working for the city of Chicago, she founded the Creative Reuse Exchange. And it's a way to get stuff that we don't use to teachers to use in their classrooms. And they get donations from businesses, individual artists, and nonprofits, so they rent out a big warehouse. That's Barbara in the back with the green apron on, looking like Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And teachers come, and everything is free. They just um, pick it up. Their motto is "Trash is a failure of the imagination." So this is their their warehouse. They, so they took ten tons of surplus from the landfills in the hands of Chicago teachers. And 85% of public school students live below the poverty level in Chicago, 85%. And Chicago teachers spend between $500 and $2,000 a year of their own money for basic office supplies like Xerox, paper, pens and pencils, glue, even cleaning and personal hygiene supplies. And on teachers' wish, wish list is getting things that, you know, we pretty much have lying around our house, like unused musical instruments and calculators and sewing machines and fabric and woodworking tools and storage containers and shelving and games and graphic novels. And so if you go to their website, you'll see all of the things that they want and some of the things they can't take. 
And the way they collect this stuff is through swap circles. So they have an opening during the year where you just go dump stuff off at this warehouse. And here's this. And then they have, they have a great website that shows things that they're interested in. You can, as, they always need volunteers, and volunteering is a lot of fun. And um, there's supposed to be a picture of people having fun volunteering. Oh, there they are. <laughs> See, you too can have fun volunteering. <laughs> Pardon me? Where is this? It's, oh, you know, they moved, they moved recently, but it's in town. Oh, 2125 West 82nd. Yeah, I think they have to keep moving to bigger and bigger places because they, they were in West, and, um, West Village for a while. Okay, so the next person, the next artist is Tanika Johnson. And she is uh, a resident of Inglewood, a lifelong resident of Inglewood. And she is the perfect example of the kind of artist I'm talking about who looked at the world immediately around her and using the resources she had, and in this case, a camera, and I, I think, and, a, and she knew how to use it, and an embedded understanding of the neighborhood as the place where she grew up, and to recontextualize it the way others see it. And I want to be careful not to speak for artists, so sometimes I'm going to read from their own words. So this is from her website. Tanika Johnson first started photographing Inglewood as a creative outlet, a natural way to document the neighborhood she grew up in, works in, and continues to call home. It wasn't until she started sharing her work with friends that she realized the images she was capturing were in direct opposition to the Englewood being portrayed on the news. So she started, uh, she, Clear Channel gave them a discount for, I think it was five billboards, and then, but they had to raise $12,000 in the community, which they did. So it was resident-led and le resident-funded. And so she, these are guys on their way to prom, and, but it didn't stop with this billboard essay. She, on her, she has this really robust website that where she, you can go to inglewoodrising.com and then you can find out about the profiles of each person. And has quite an ex extensive um, profile on each person, and you'll find out that all of these volunteers are giving back to Englewood in some way, I mean, these citizens. So like, for example, Nicole is um, working for Team Wood, Teamwork Englewood. And so then you go to her website, um, Tanika's Englewood Rising website, and you see that there are a bunch of organizations. And then you can go down here to Teamwork Englewood. So in this way, she's building this, this um, network of, you know, it creates a ripple effect of, of pride, uh, information sharing, and inspiration. And by the way, all the photos on this, on here are from Tanika. And so she did another thing. She expanded this a little bit. This was home movies that were projected on the side of a building after a night bike ride, the Englewood video projection party. And one of the things I am learning from learning about her work is that in Englewood, people are afraid to go out at night there aren't a lot of places for them to meet and social and mingle. And so she is addressing that by this very um, guerrilla approach. So none of these things cost a lot of money. They just take thinking about what do your, does your community need, who is your community. And so, and, and this is art. I mean, this is, this is what, this is public art now. And then she does this amazing project, that's, this is a museum show now, and you might have heard of it, where she takes uh, an address that's on the south side of Chicago and partners it with, uh, and looks at what the corresponding address on the north side, and then she has the people switch places. So here's someone from the north side who is in the south side address that's the same as his house, and here's the woman who lives in that house on the north side, in that guy's, on that guy's front porch. So for example, here's 6720 North Ashland, and here's 6720 South Ashland. I think these speak for themselves. Uh, Maria Gaspar, I don't know how many of you have heard of her, she's doing this breathtakingly ambitious and important project called 96 Acres. And it's a, um, 
96 acres, the title is, takes its name from the amount of land that the Cook County Jail is on. And what she did is she, there were a couple of other, there's a writer's group that she worked with where they went inside, literally, in these, and they got the stories from these men and the men did sketches. And then they were projected. These were all moving in images. These were all animations. And this is projected on the outside of the jail. And this was just a few weeks ago. So we, um, and you hear, and they, she had very good speakers, so you could just hear the men's voices all around you reading their stories that were being illustrated by the drawings that were made here. And so we sat in a dusty lot. The audience sat there and watched these stories and these images made by the men on the other side of this place. Um, that, an outside, inside situation. So in her own words, she says, it's important to me that the artistic project that has evolved over the last six years when I began it in 2012 is understood as an art project, a series of site interventions, and an ever-evolving community-engaged project. It works directly with those most impacted by incarceration inside and outside of the jail and attempts to reveal the tension between the jail's simultaneously visibility slash invisibility in all its political, social, and cultural complexities. Through art, performance, sound, installation, theater, etc., the art project puts shape and form to what is often unseen and misunderstood. Okay, so this next one is just like hold on to your seat because it's like a lot. Um, <laughs> Do, we, do many of you know Ed Marzuski? Mars Brewery, Code Prosperity Sphere, Maria's Packaged Goods, Kimski. Ed, Ed has an empire. He's the self-described art school dropout. And he's a particular inspiration for me because it's close to what I envisioned for the Corner Project. He started Lumpen Magazine in the late 80s while he was still in college. Um, I think he was studying writing and, and graphic design. And he says that his strengths are that he's a great facilitator and a collaborator. Since then, Lumpen is up, I don't know how many issues it's had, it's up into its hundreds of issues. And um, so he's born in, and, he, and he's done all of this that I'm about to show you. I think he only had one DKS grant the entire time. And uh, without any foundation support, so he was born in Beverly and he lived in Bridgeport for 30 years. And it's going um, to take a while to unpack everything here. This is the artist as entrepreneur. And all artists are entrepreneurial, of course, whether, whether we know it or not. But Ed has tapped into his inner entrepreneur to create community and give back to the Bridgeport that he loves so well. He's created, so this is um, some of the spin-offs from Lumpen. And then he does uh, festivals. This is version. And of course, he'd be the first to say he has a lot of collaborators and contributors that help with this. He's created an entire community around him, around these activities. <coughs> so he's did the Midway Fair, Select Media Festival, the Freedom Festival, and that's not even all of them. They do music releases. He started a radio station inside the co-prosperity sphere. He's so funny, I was talking to him and he was saying, they thought it would take like years of red tape to do this. And it was like, no, you just pay $25 for a fee and Get, an, get a radio antenna, and it's like, you could have a radio station. <laughs> so it's 105.5 FM, and it's really good. It's got 24 hours of local programming. There's, inside, the, inside one of the buildings that he owns, there's the, uh, the radio booth. It's, and I listen to it, you can, you can hear it all the way up in Avondale. And then he has this, he's, because of his love of graphic design, he has this very good annual typography and graphic design show. Um, that he curates, or it's, it's juried. But, and I'll get to the beer later, but you can see this uh, reflected on the beer, beer labels of the brewing company that he has started. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So this is the Co-Prosperity Sphere. It's at 3219 South Morgan. And inside they have exhibits and the radio station and it's, they rent it out for events and it's a tremendous number of people who come. Right down the street is Maria's Package Good. This is uh, owned by his mother who is Korean. And he and his brother, I think, manage it now, but he's turned it into this, um, Maria's Package Good Guest Chicago's uh, number one in Chicago's best bars. And he always calls everything community, like Maria's Package Good and Community Bar. And they have cultural events. 
right next to it is he took over this crappy little building and turned it into this wonderful restaurant called Kimsky's because his dad is Polish. So his mother's Korean, he's, his dad is Polish, he says in high school, people didn't know what to make of him, like was he black, was he white? He calls himself beige. <laughs> and so like they have, everything has an extra little flair. Like here's, like the first Sunday of every month, they have eat, drink, and dance, brunch. Here in the backyard is the Chicago Play Test Society uh, doing parlor games, you know, and food. Here is Mars Brewery. He bought this old building about a mile away in this old industrial wasteland in, um, on Iron Street. It's at 3630 South Iron Street, if everybody, anybody knows where that is. No, of course you don't. And he started this, this brew pub because he and his friends would, he met these guys over at Maria's Packaged Goods and they talk about beer and then they start brewing beer and then before you know it, he set up this whole, he started a brewery. And in the brewery, there's always lots of art, and it's called Mars Community Brewery. So my last one is, I'm gonna go really fast. This does not do it judges. This is a, another one, this is called Experimental Station. It was started by Dan Peterman and his wife Connie Spreen in the late eight, uh, 1980s. And, 90s and um, in 2006, Connie Dan is still on the board, but um, has is very busy with his own independent art career. And Connie has a doctorate in I think Romance Languages from the University of Chicago, and so she's the executive director now. And it houses the Blackstone Bicycle Works, the 61st Street Farmers Market, and Link Up Illinois. And let me tell you a little bit. They started this farmer's market and she found out that people had no way to spend food stamps at farmer's markets anywhere in the state. So it required like a change of legislation. And um, she got the contract, Experimental Station got the contract for having Link taken at all of the farmer's markets. So this is something that you know, one arts organization can do. And then inside, um, they rent to these, they rent to these uh, small nonprofits. Build Coffee is a coffee shop, which is awesome. If you've never been there, you should go. Um, City Bureau is a uh, collective of journalists. In fact, you can write for them if you want. It's community journalism. Southside Weekly is a, a, an old paper that uh, has published for, about the site side, the Invisible Institute, I forget what that is. But now I am done, and I would love it if it wasn't just a regular Q&A, but if some of you wanted to share projects that you're doing in your own communities or that you wish you were doing, or artists that you know of, and also Q&A too. I'm going to start calling on people if you don't. <laughs> I don't. Well, I just wanted to mention that Visible Institute is uh, run by Jamie Calvin, who's the person who really pushed to get the uh, videotape of the shooting oh. of LeBron McDonald. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, I didn't know that. Out of City Hall and into the public. Wow. And uh, it took a long time. And they stalled, you know, stalled on it until after the election. So he, you would say he, how would you describe him, like a political, a a, or investig oh right, he's an investigative journalist. Yeah. That's right, I did know, I did know that. I didn't know about all of that, but I, I knew that that's what they were, they were doing there. Thanks. Elizabeth, I believe you had a question. Yeah, so when do you think your work switched to, to really be politically based? It was really led by me just starting out with a blank slate and looking out on that street and starting to notice, hey, there are an awful lot of vacant buildings. And then doing all this research like, hey, these buildings don't need to be vacant. And then just un sort of unpacking why they're vacant and 
one of, the, one of my confessions is one of the things I'm really frustrated with, and just like Saul Alinsky says, you know you've gotten to the core of a problem, or like in physics where it's like you've got it down to two elements who are pushing together. I came to that with the Corner Project. There are people who think that it's every man for himself, and, it's, and, the, and that the, the uh, civic infrastructure, what am I trying to say, cityscape, is just like their responsibility ends at the boundaries of their building, and then there are those of us who feel like it's an ecosystem, and that our fates rise and fall and depend on each other communicating. And that's one of the things that's become most aggravating to me where I'm drawing on Saul Alinsky and Jane Adams, John Chibi, please help me, you know. So, and it inevitably leads to becoming political. So that's how, if you're going to fall, instead of being in this kind of sanitized bubble about making art about issues <laughs> and, and that doing art that actually does something about issues, you just suddenly get out of that bubble and you're, you're into that, that whole big mess. I mean, I've, I've faced real anger from, from property owners um, who, you know, who say, that I'm getting in their business. But they don't understand that what they do affects our business too. And so that's one of my big frustrations is how, how do you get that across? So what I'm doing, in fact, just today, I'm forming a coalition of, of artists and we're gonna have an ideation session with these property owners and also other artists to talk about um, how to revitalize our main street. So we won't make it personal, but we'll talk, we'll make it, I look in terms of the street as possibilities and potentials, not, not problems. And so if we approach it that way, maybe we'll get a few people, a few property owners who will want to come along with that. Are, are you still considered a little bit of an anomaly by the people who've been in your neighborhood longer? Yeah, you Oh, you know, they're too polite to tell me. <laughs> I, they're, one of the big fears in our neighborhood is displacement, and <coughs> artists are synonymous with gentrification, and so I think they look at what I'm doing, it's like, you know, there goes the neighborhood, you know, an artist has moved in. So there's that dance to deal with. Artists, in fact, are not the cause of gentrification. I've actually done some research about that. This whole first year of the Corner Project was research. This uh, September started the second year. So research and relationship building for the first year. So building up the social infrastructure. And the second year has been about uh, deploying those relationships and resources into, into action. So we're just starting that phase. Is anybody working on any projects or know of any artists working on projects in their neighborhoods? Do any of you, are, how many of you are artists? Mary Beth. Oh my gosh, I'm all the way Yeah, this is great, are the best, that's really cool. Thank you all for coming even though you're, okay. you're not artists. But, so I'm just gonna use you as an example. Where do you live and what, what is the situation around where you live? I don't mean your address, but like if you look outside your, your window. Well, I live in the suburbs. <laughs> so, I live in Glen Ellen, and um, I live just a couple blocks south of College of DuPage. Um, it's not, what do you say? I heard Glen Ellen is not the fancy area of Glen Ellen. It's unincorporated, so it's um, much more woodsy. Um, you know, when I have a background window, there's only right across the street. And art. Um, it's just, you know, it's, what needs to be done out there? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Glen Ellen and we, I mean, um, what do I say? They're not as, I, I, this is just my opinion too, kind of based from out there. But, <coughs> um, put anyway, but I don't think it's <coughs> as much of an artistic hub. I'm not talking about art, I just mean. Yeah, just to think about, just to look out as a blank slate. What other neighborhoods do people 
Donc, il y a Actually, as part of my research, discovered that there was something called the Vacancy Fraud Act that got stalled in Congress, in, in the state legislature. Right. And it's to tax storefronts on their potential use, not their current use. Yeah. And it's exactly true what she said. They get a tax break for keeping their storefronts. And so <laughs> Will Gazzardi happens to have his office on our, on our three blocks, as does Senator Iris Martinez. So I. Uh, talked to Will about that and he found out he was the sponsor of the bill and he's going to reintroduce it next year and get going. And the reason it got stalled was an ally of Bruce Rauner in the Senate or the state legislature used, some, somehow stalled it and just doesn't make sense to me because exactly of what J.B. Pritzker did. So somehow the legislation got stalled because that now it became between Warner and Pritzker, and this was even before Pritzker was, was running. Yeah. But you're saying that there is legislation that is going against this, that is going yeah, to, it would, they're trying to introduce, trying to get them to the... Yeah, it's already uh, has two sponsors. I mean, in terms of supporting it, what do what you think, I mean, what are the best things to do to try and make that come? Because it's, it's you know, it's like, Pardon my French, but shitting in your own bed. You know, there's no point in destroying a neighborhood where you own property. It's just silly. And that is the mentality I'm talking about. It's yeah. like it defies logic. Yeah. So many of the owners probably don't even live in this neighborhood. Right. You know, no, they don't have to look out every day and see it like, I, yeah, like we, we do. We do in, this, in our community have many empty storefronts as well. Well, and here's the stupid thing they're all waiting for a chain store, you know, a franchise to come and give them double or triple the rent. Those stores aren't coming back. That's another thing I found out. Retail is not coming back. And those chain stores are, are dying too. The ones that were like the, sh the sure things, they're dying as well. And so we as a group of artists, um, so it's not just the Corner Project now, it's the Hairpin Arts Center, it's Elastic Arts, it's Avondale Neighborhood Association. So now we've put together this coalition that was you know, stimulated by the Corner Project. So now we're meeting and we're talking about how we as artists, what we can do about this identified situation. Um, so we're gonna be having an ideation session about that. Yeah. Is there any movement uh, to incorporate the artist community with non artists that have the same goals that you have? Totally. One of the first things um, I did with the Corner Project is I got a lot of the business and property owners together on the three blocks, and Dion Bo from Urban Maine offered to facilitate a visioning section for us. And so we all got together, just us. There were no artists, it was all just the people who were stakeholders. And we talked about what we wanted to, how we wanted to see this happen. And so now the artist. And so one of the things that came out of that meeting is they wanted to have a neighborhood organization. So I started the Milwaukee Avenue Alliance, and we took us a while to get our 501c3 because I didn't know what I was doing, and now we have a, a little board that I keep forgetting about because I'm so used to working by myself that I keep forgetting I'm supposed to ask them things, for permission, but um, I'm learning. And so now the, so the artists, getting the artists together was the thing I'm doing last. 
my, this last year has been spent focusing on the business and property owners. So now we're going to be having a confab. So artists will be part of the alliance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just think that there's another whole community out there. I, I think I can speak for the four people in this row. They grew up in a great neighborhood on the south side of Chicago that's become a, a pit. And uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a letter to, to the mayor. He said, why don't we get together a bunch of the old guys from the neighborhood to go out there and talk to these kids and tell them what a great neighborhood this used to be? And he never answered me. But I mean, I think that uh, Chicago is a, a city of neighborhoods, and people that grew up in a, in a particular neighborhood have a particular affection for the neighborhood, and we still talk about it, although none of us live there anymore. And uh, I just think there's a, there's there's a, a potential of people that would be interested in the projects that you're doing that aren't artists, but people that love their old community, that they'd like to see it what, become what it was when we grew up. I think that's the one takeaway I want everyone to have from this, is that all these artists are doing this without permission. They're just, they're taking the lead, and because if you waited for the city to do anything for you, they just wouldn't. So. Um, I can, I, I can give you a ton more examples, but so yeah, you, you, would have, you would have to do it. Or find, have you looked to see if there are any other organizations or any art, other, what neighborhood is it? South Shore. South Shore, I'm not familiar with that one, but there are artists everywhere. Well, it's, it's uh, yeah, South Side of Chicago, Ike Martin High School, South Shore High School, Baldwin High School, and, uh, and it's all on the way. Even the smallest thing you can do. What? That's Dorchester. The Yeah. The Astors. Yeah. Well, on Stony Island, you talk about the Stony South. Yeah, and that's. Yeah, he does. It's kind of different. Yeah, I mean, I would rather see people go out and start their own, their own thing. I mean, of course, join together. But I, Theaster's seems to be um, his own his own project. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be no help. But just even starting out with the smallest thing, like in your own front yard, would help, or have meetings or dinners. on artists because this is a talk about artists working in public spaces and in public life but all of you have your own come from your own perspective and have your own resources I I don't know what yours are but just to start looking at what you have with where you are what you can do and start your own thing you don't have to be an artist I had a question about, because you know, you're talking about art in the public, but you're also a public artist, which implies public funds. What is that process of, of winning 
or applying and winning a commission. Mm -hmm. And how many commissions are there in, say, Chicago? I, I haven't found that many in Chicago, and Chicago is just kind of outside the mainstream and the way they do things. Um, <laughs> the typical way, there, there are um, hundreds and hundreds of public art agencies around the country that get percent for art from capital building projects, like if a library or a fire station or something, they'll get one between a half a percent and 2% from that as a set aside for art. And then they put out a request for qualifications. And that can either go nationally or uh, regionally. And then artists like me apply for them. And then there's a jury, a selection jury, that's usually made up, like say it's a library, it'll be the head librarian, it might be a couple of artists in the community, it might be the architect for that building. In Chicago, the staff makes the decisions about what gets chosen. And, um, they just issued a huge RFQ, like one of the first ones I've seen in a long time, for a, a project on the, riv on the river walk that's between one to two million, it's gonna have a budget of one to two million dollars. So uh, clearly they're looking, they're looking, they have phrases in the RFQ like artists who are at the top of their profession. Right. It's like, so clearly they're looking for an art star on the caliber of the Millennium Park yeah, people. I think, I think they, No, yeah, just a request for qualifications. So I'm going to submit anyway because I feel like I'm not chopped liver. Uh, it's, a, it's a big reach for me because uh, I've never done a project that was for a million dollars before. The most expensive one I've done is 750000 It's in Portland. So um, I've only done a few projects in, in Chicago, and, but the rest of them have been around. But like that piece in Wicker Park the, with the worker cottage, that was done by the SSA the Chamber of Commerce with SSA, that was all done in-house, that wasn't a City of Chicago project. Mm -hmm. Do some of these uh, juries or the board that select have community members? Oh yeah, they always do. How do you get to one of those? Um, find out who, who is, I don't know what part of town you live in, but you could find out like D Case has these artist, um, these small artist grants, and they re require they re um, they rely on panels of volunteers to review them. And the next, uh, God, what are they called? Does anybody here remember? They're like individual artist grants, and they come out in October, they should be any day now, literally, they should be coming out. And it's done by D-Case, and they need panels to review all the hundreds and maybe thousands of applications that they get. And that would be a really good thing to volunteer to be on. So you would, um, I think you, you would, con first, the best thing to do would be to look at the, uh, the call for artists that comes out, the RFQ, just go to DCASE, you'll find it. And there'll be a name at the bottom of who you should contact and uh, if you wanted to volunteer to be on that selection panel. But, you know, then find out like um, all sorts of places like the Hyde Park Arts Center, every time, you know, they, they're always looking for board members and various people on jury, so there are every, every single one of these organizations needs volunteers. So that's a good way to, to get your foot in the door. Anything else? What does our Q stand for? Request for qualifications, as opposed to request for proposals, which is an RFP, which um, I led the charge a few years ago to try to wipe those out because they're essentially asking for artists to submit their work product. The hardest part is coming up with the idea oh. at, at the open call stage. And it um, it's only works really if it's going to be something super local mm -hmm. because then you could go check the site and uh, do a site visit and stuff. But it's, it's like throwing darts yeah. blindfolded at a dartboard to try to figure out there's one, there's a big one right now in, in Evanston that it's a $400,000 project. They, they sent it out as an RFP. And I, I'm, 
on principle, I'm against RFPs, but on the other hand, it is close enough. It's local. I could go do it. But since I don't know, since I'm the one that tried to st started a national movement to eradicate RFPs, I'm probably be a little hypocritical. <laughs> Yes? What do you think that a place for more sort of traditional public art with murals and mosaics and what? I'm so glad you asked that. Murals are taking on a whole new life. I had James Jankowiak paint a mural on the side of my building. You might have seen it, that butterfly mural. Mm -hmm. And people like seek it out. Like there are like at least five times a day people are out there taking pictures of it. And then across the street, uh, one of my neighbors had a construction barricade up around his building for like two years. And so there's a little gallery of street artists that's just down the street. And so I put him together with them and they would go out and paint murals. People are like stopping their cars and going out and taking pictures. There's like an incredible street mural revival thing going on. And then places like Facebook and Google headquarters are commissioning these street artists who used to like get arrested for to do these murals in their headquarters. Yeah? Columbia College has started a program called the Wabash Art Corridor. And Mark Kelly. Yeah. Congress to Street. Yeah, and Mark Kelly, when he was at Columbia, did that, and now he's the commissioner of uh, cultural affairs at DKs. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So, I mean, ideally, if I could get some of these old farts who own some of the buildings on our street to have murals painted on their alleys or in the, you know, stuff, that would be a really revival thing. So, I say it with affection. <laughs> yes? So, uh, in terms of, um, I had seen the articles and, and heard the news about the, some of the, some of the uh, errors that the city has done in terms of like accidentally, accidentally whitewashing the, 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 the yeah. 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 the mural or the or the JC Rivera mural over there at the South Park Bowl line. So I was wondering on, on your thoughts on the, I know that I know that after that happened that, that there was a little bit of talk mm -hmm. about in city council committee about trying to create some type of um, some type of master of this so that so that everyone one can hopefully refer to a master of this and and, uh, and not have that happen. But, but I guess there's a, there's a little positive and negative about creating such a such a list. So I just wanted to wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, my my neighbor who had the the construction barricade up, we had put in so many complaints about the vacant storefronts across the street that the streets and stand guys, I forget what the the, the street artists call them came and they just like wiped the whole mural out one day. And then across from the worker cottage, there's the Hugh Brantley mural um, that was really famous. And uh, they, the streets and sand guys. And so what you have is this like this unofficial crew of art critics. Yeah. Like they, they don't wipe out the James Jankowiak mural on my side of my building, but across the street, they wiped out this really elaborate like street arty looking mural that was that was there another thing that's really funny that you there's this there's this guy in streets and sen like if you want to get a street banner because we did artistic street banners on our street his name is hugh he works in streets and sen and he decides whether it's art or not <laughs> on your banner yes. i know it's just hilarious so all these things you just start getting into i mean that i just start getting here when i got outside the art world. Yeah. Got it. And he's been there forever. Like you talk to anybody who's in a chamber of commerce in any t and they'll be like, oh yeah, Hugh. Yeah, you can, you gotta work with it, Hugh. And I called him up and I was telling him about how we want to do these art banners and it's like, so you know what do we need? He's, he's like, hold on little lady. <laughs> I'm gonna decide. <laughs> yeah, no, Chicago's just just fascinating. <laughs> All right, that's time. Thank you, you've been wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Fred. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Uh, we have one more uh, lecture in this series, uh, and it's going to be on December 9th from 1 to 2.30 at the Chicago Cultural Center. It's on the Chicago Imagists, an early Chicago art uh, by Ariel Lazar, who's a uh, uh, lecturer down at the University of Chicago. 
So that's our next series. But this, we thank the, uh, the Terra Foundation and Art Design Chicago, as well as uh, the Graham School at the University of Chicago. So thank you all for coming and hope to see you in December. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.